West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Okay, so the company was called Atlas. Atlas. Atlas Technology International. Um, it appeared to be funded and perhaps run by a firm in China, in Shanghai. Uh, but what this company said its business was when it filed its annual report with the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, what they said their business was, was selling cakes and, cakes and cupcakes. In the United States, quote, we are a bakery based company in California specializing in freshly made cakes and cupcakes. We engage in the business of selling a wide variety of cupcakes and other baked goods under the brand name Sweets and Treats. Okay, so they're doing business as Sweets and Treats, but their real name is Atlas Technology, which is kind of a weird name for what is a cupcake company, right? But okay. Watch what happens next. The following year, the same company, Atlas Technology International, they file their annual report with the SEC, but now, instead of the cupcakes thing, which has just disappeared, now, quote, the company develops, designs, and distributes touchscreen technology. That is quite a change in business plan. The annual report goes on, quote, the company has yet to establish Atlas as a renowned brand for touch touchscreen technology. Well, yeah, I mean, give them a break. Just last year, Atlas was selling fresh baked cupcakes. They've only just gone from baked cupcakes to touchscreens. We learned about this odd business from the Washington Post today which noted that the same Shanghai folks behind that company also ran another company. This one claimed to be a smartphone sales company in Miami Beach, <laughs> but it did not appear to have sold anything, not a single thing ever to anyone. You're a sales company? Uh, there was also a company run by the same guys in Shanghai, a different company, that claimed to be developing autonomous drone software. Pretty cutting edge stuff. Uh, well, that company, it had zero employees. Maybe the drones were so autonomous they were going to design themselves. Really cutting edge. So the SEC looked at these companies, publicly traded companies in the United States that all appeared to be fake. And the SEC determined that, yeah, these were fake companies. These guys in China were not running companies selling smartphones or drones or cupcakes with or without touchscreens. Um, but if you're running you know, a publicly traded entity, there's a lot of rules about not being fake. <laughs> and so the SEC stepped in and more or less kicked those companies off the stock exchange. For a couple of them, they actually issued what's called a stop order. Um, the SEC forcibly stopped these companies from selling any more public shares. And stop orders are a serious thing and they are a rare thing. In the past 10 years, something like 35 companies total have gotten stop orders like this. 
Of the 35 in the past 10 years, at least three of them were run by the same group of guys in China, in Shanghai. Well, now this Chinese firm in Shanghai that appears to specialize in launching publicly traded companies that mislead regulators and investors and then get everybody involved in trouble. Uh, I'll give you one guess as to what their new high profile investment is. Yes, it's Donald Trump's latest business venture, the former president's supposed media company. Uh, this is the lead today at The Washington Post. This is incredible. Quote, a Chinese firm helping former President Donald Trump take his new media company public has been the target of investigations by federal securities regulators who say the firm misrepresented shell companies with no products and few employees as ambitious, growing enterprises. Huh. Misrepresenting your companies as wildly successful businesses in order to get people to fork over their cash to you. Whatever could have attracted this Chinese firm to the founder of Trump University? Game recognizes game, right? I guess. Because the thing to remember about the Trump media company that was just launched, announced a, a couple of months ago with great fanfare, now, Donald Trump is going to launch a new social media platform. He's going to have all this digital and streaming content. And it was going to be like Facebook and Fox News and Netflix all rolled into one. The thing to remember about this company is that it appears to not exist at all yet. One securities lawyer telling the Post today, quote, there is a shell company, one of these companies created by the Chinese firm, basically merging with another shell company, because as far as we know, the Trump media company hasn't yet been formed. But that has not stopped this Chinese firm's company from raising hundreds of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars from the public to supposedly eventually invest in this ostensible Trump media company, which does not exist. A financing deal that is now under investigation by both the SEC and by FINRA, the financial industry uh, regulator, regulatory authority. Because even by the Wild West standards of kind of the scummy end of Wall Street, this deal is sending up red flags left and right. And, and I know nothing should surprise us anymore, but even for the most cynical among us, you have to admit this is a little bit gobsmacking, right? This guy spent his entire presidency talking about getting tough on China, China, right? To, to turn, to, to, he turns to a, a dubious Chinese firm to finance his first business venture since leaving office and they're immediately under a federal investigation because of all the previous cons they have pulled off. Joining us now is Washington Post reporter Doug McMillan, who along with his colleague Jonathan O'Connell broke this story today about Trump's partnership, partnership with this Chinese firm. Uh, Mr. McMillan, thank you so much for your time tonight. I really appreciate you being here. Hey, Rachel. Thanks for having me. So over the last few years, looking at sort of shady business stuff around the former president, one of the things that I have found difficult, just at a personal level, is that his business, to some degree, maybe for the most part, has been real estate. And it strikes me that big city real estate of the type he's involved in always seems really shady and scummy to everybody who looks in on it from the outside, who doesn't know the business. And it was sort of hard to tell whether he was worse and doing more egregious things than everybody else in what is already sort of a dirty business. Applying that same sort of standard to this as a Wall Street story, is this Chinese firm an outlier in terms of this corner of Wall Street, these types of um, deals and the kind of scrutiny that they've attracted? Well, this is definitely an unusual firm to choose for one of the most high profile deals on Wall Street. I mean, the, the Trump SPAC, it's a special purpose acquisition company, is something a lot of people are talking about, a lot of people are looking forward to and has drawn a lot of investor interest, despite, as you mentioned, little being known about the actual business. It appears that Trump's media and social media business is very nascent. Um, it's, it's put out some PowerPoint presentations about how it plans to eventually compete with social media companies like Twitter and streaming companies like Netflix. But there seems to be very little substance behind those claims right now. And they have you know, very few known employees, for example, and apparently no revenue. And this is a company that through this deal will be turned into a public company overnight. So you know, we took a close look at the deal and we started looking more and more at this company, um, uh, Arc, um, Arc Capital and found that this is definitely an outlier. This is a tiny, tiny firm based in Shanghai. They, do, they have some global offices, but they have no offices 
in the United States. And we talked to former employees of these companies who said that the founder and the leaders of our capital are really interested in this idea of the U.S. regulatory markets and the SEC is, is easier to get into and easier to list shell businesses or businesses with little revenue or little behind it or very early stage startup businesses than the regulators in China or Hong Kong and other parts of Asia. So part of their business model from the get go was to try to help Chinese firms with you know very nascent business models bring their companies public in the U.S. market. And they've had you know a very um, a mixed track record. We haven't found a whole lot of success stories and yet they have you know, this regulatory cloud. They have had a number of deals end up in the crosshairs of SEC investigators, as you mentioned. Is it a problem if Trump's company turns out to be fake, like those other fake companies associated with this Shanghai group that you guys wrote about today? I mean, is it, are there, are there rules about all this money that has been raised by these means for this supposed Trump media venture? If it never comes to fruition, can they just take the money and run? So interesting thing about this deal, it's it's a merger deal. It's not a traditional IPO. And that somehow gives them a little bit more latitude to make bold claims that they don't necessarily support right away. But once the merger goes through and the Trump business is publicly listed, they're going to have to pretty soon start sharing their financials. They're going to have to start having audited financial statements, you know, quarterly earnings reports. Um, and you're going to have to actually start to see what is this business. And if it's a shell business, there, you're allowed to have a shell business with no active operations in the U.S. Um, you have to like be clear and upfront about that. Uh, but it, you know, it appears that they're not going that route, and it appears that they are going to try to build this, uh, you know, media company, social media company. And yeah, eventually there are going to be investors who are going to want to see that company happen. You know, at the end of this deal, there's going to be over 1.2 billion dollars in, uh, in Donald Trump and his associates' pockets, and. You know, they're they're going to have a responsibility or there's going to be an expectation by investors who own shares in that company that they own shares in a media company. So, yeah, I do eventually think they're going to have to you know, make good on some of their promises. Um, do they have to you know meet their rosiest possible projections that Trump is making? They're projecting something like over three billion dollars in the next five years. Uh, I don't think you know, I don't think legally they're bound to that. But I think that you're definitely going to have to start seeing some efforts towards uh, building a business. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens if you know, that ends up not being the case. It is Friday, the 24th of December of 2021. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Blue Moon Spirits Christmas Eve Friday. That's right, we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life, uh, lined up at the major bearing gifts and uh, tales of yore. Okay, I have no idea what that means, but it means something to somebody somewhere. Okay, well, you know, the cult seems to uh, be turning on the cult leader. This is a natural progression of what happens in cults. Uh, Now the cult leader is not pure enough. Mm -hmm. A bunch of maggots went to uh, one of the Trump uh, eateries and they were turned away because they were not masked. And now they're calling Donald Trump a fraud. (laughs) I hate to tell you this, but when we were calling him a fraud before he was even elected, people like you got all pissed off and wanted to beat the crap out of us. Do you remember that? Apparently not. Because uh, memory is not something that uh, is important, apparently, on that side of the political spectrum. Or shall we just say, they do possess selective memory. Okay, well, I'm uh, I'm kind of getting tired of this Nazi takeover of the United States of America. We're getting way past the, oh, well, everything's legal, to, hey, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Line up over here. Ah, FEMA camps. And, uh, oh, poor Madison Cawthorn. Speaking of Nazis. (laughs) 
Apparently, he and his betrothed are going to be no longer betrothed after only eight months. Now, his story about how he met his wife has a bit of intrigue. I gotta tell ya. How Madison Cawthorn found himself in a Russian bar speaking with some Russian guy who says, Oh, yeah, I do CrossFit. Meet me in Florida. Okay. And then uh, it wasn't for a CrossFit session, apparently. But uh, Cawthorn's uh, future wife was there, and they fell instantly in love. Uh huh. Sounds like a Russian plan to me, but hey, that's just me. So apparently, they're getting divorced after eight months because her job is done. <laughs> she doesn't need to hang around anymore. She's not Melania, where this is going to go on for decades. Yeah, well, he groomed uh, Trump for a long time. And if anybody thinks that Melania is not his handler, I don't think you know how it works. <laughs> well, at the very least, it makes quite a bizarre spy novel, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So Madison Cawthorn and his Russian wife, or is she Slavic? Very interesting that she happens to be there as a, I don't know, a CrossFit session? With some Russian guy that he meets in a Russian bar somewhere? And I got to tell you, oh, no, it's a casino. That's right. And according to some people who are in the know, they're trying to figure out where that casino was. Because it wasn't necessarily near Moscow. Apparently, from what I remember from a couple of articles, is that there's not really a a Moscow casino. So he could have been in St. Petersburg is uh, one speculation. But isn't it odd that Papadopoulos, <laughs> yeah, just happens to be speaking to somebody in a bar and he lets loose with uh, the goods. And then and then he he's kind of set up with uh, a woman from the area of the former Soviet Union. Coincidence? It seems convenient to me. But that's just me. Okay, well, uh, you know, apparently, according to Eric Trump, we liberals gave up on God a long time ago. That's why we're godless. Really? I would probably say the same thing about you, buddy. Can you imagine a Trump going to church? I can't. <laughs> Why are there no photos of them going to service on Sunday? How about Easter? Oh, Christmas. They never go to church. God. And yet they can make these proclamations about people who actually live by the golden rule. And some people don't live by the golden rule. They think that the golden rule is a little too oppressive in terms of how you treat other people. Because maybe we should be treating other people with love and goodwill, even though they don't extend it to us. Maybe. Because i got to tell you, I'm at the point where I don't want any Christmas truce with a Nazi. Not this year. There is no Christmas truce. They're not just like us. Please. And I'll remind folks that we don't have to import Nazism here. The Nazis learn how to be Nazis by looking at our right-wing segregationist bigots. And the eugenicist movement as well. So, it's homegrown. The reason I call it Nazi takeover is because that's what it is. American Nazi, it has its own little flavor. Sort of like being an American Catholic. (laughs) Oh, another another little story that came across the transom. Apparently, a Catholic school had a basketball tournament going on, and the student body of this Catholic school started chanting monkey at the opposing team, which had some players of color. Well, the Catholic school said, no, they're not saying that. 
<laughs> they were chanting, go Eags, because they're the Eagles. Go Eags. Yeah, well, let's go, Cowlick. <laughs> no, I'm, I was baptized, baptized Catholic. I know when someone is uh, you know, trying to pull the proverbial wool over one's eyes. That's one thing about Catholic school is that they do teach you critical thinking. So let's go, Cowlick. And you know what the Cowlick stands for now, don't you? Hmm? Hmm? <laughs> yeah. Didn't take me too long. Maybe I should have taken more time. Maybe. So we are in a world of hurt. How one extends peace and goodwill in the time of our Lord's birth is to chant monkey at players of color from an opposing school at a Catholic basketball tournament. That's where we are. Let's give kids guns. Let's not look for the red flags. The reason that parents don't see the red flags is because there should be a red flag law drawn against them to begin with. That's why. They don't think anything they're doing is wrong, so of course their kid's not doing anything wrong. You know? How many times have I heard parents who, in spite of incontrovertible evidence, still con are convinced their little Ethan, their little Kyle, is just perfectly innocent. He was harmed. All right. Oh, Tom Cotton came up in the, in the sort of New scan this morning. Um, his proclamation suddenly escapes me. I did respond to it on social media, and that would be Twitter. <laughs> yes, it would. But what I want to know, what I want to know, is how is it that a Tom Cotton, how is it that a Josh Hawley, how is it that a Jim Jordan, Mo Brooks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are still sitting in Congress right now. I suppose there should be a trial, should there not? If they waged an insurrection against the United States, if they attempted to overthrow the United States government on January 6th, According to the Constitution, and I've said this before, and I'm going to just belabor the point. According to the Constitution, you are not allowed to hold elected public office. How is it that they still sit in the legislature? How is it they still sit in the Senate? How is it that they can still be undersecretaries in all of these different departments? How is it that they can be cops? How is it that they can be soldiers? Because, I'll tell you why, unlike Antifa, they have all the guns. The reason we hear Antifa so much is because Antifa has no way to protect themselves. Antifa has no way to wage war. But the people with the guns, the people with the fifty calibers, the people with the Sidewinder missiles, the people with uh, uh, tanks, bazookas, etc., 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 they get to decide what is polite conversation. They get to decide what kind of books are going to be in the library. They get to decide what is going to be taught in the schools. Not Antifa. Not the Democratic Party. That would be the domain of the neo-Nazis. Did we let it happen? Well, you know, I'll belabor this point. The one thing Nazis know how to do is use your laws and your rules against you. We keep saying, oh, well, we can't play dirty back. Yeah, well, you know, pretty soon you won't be able to play at all. Dirty or otherwise. 
They say that we we are overreacting to their violent rhetoric, and yet violence is perpetuated daily upon volunteer election workers, not by Antifa, not by the Socialist Worker Party, if that still exists, not by Democratic members of America. One party and their psychophants do that. Antifa is not taking over over local school boards. That would be Proud Boys and Three Percenters, you know, neo Nazis. Did we allow it to happen? Well, we were just following the rules now, weren't we? Is that banal? Maybe. Okay, well, Merry Christmas! <laughs> or as we used to say back in the day, Merry Savage Christmas. And uh, what a savage Christmas it is, so we might as well pull out the Saw movies. And yes, the Saw movies are Christmas movies. You just have to look at them a certain way, you know, a little bit with a glint. Yes, a little squint there. Ooh. And then you'll understand why a savage Christmas might be something, well, to honor, if not celebrate. <laughs> Indeed. Well, we do have a curated show today, and uh, why not? It's Christmas Eve. You know, people still work on Christmas Eve. This isn't work. This is our civic duty. Okay? Okay. Well, of course, at the top, Rachel broke down that sketchy Chinese company under... Federal investigation. I just love that. That that that's not a stopgap with Trump. In fact, it's a prerequisite. You want to do business with me, you have to be under investigation by the feds. That's the only way I can trust that you'll do what I need you to do. All right. Who's doing who to what in that partnership? We'll soon find out, won't we? Yes, we will. On the rest of the menu, the Democratic governor of Kansas broke with Biden over vaccines in a crass ploy to appeal to Republican voters. I don't know. Maybe she thinks it's only Republican voters who are dying so she doesn't have to care. I don't know. Let's not do the right thing. Let's not do the thing for public health. Let's do that which is just holding on to our power. And we're saying that we're afraid we'll become like them. Yeah. GOP representatives would rather prioritize the national party line over failing local bridges. Well, we know that. And, well, here's some good news. 40 federal judges were confirmed in 2021, and Joe Biden nominated two more. Well, you know what? How about expanding the Supreme Court? Otherwise, we get nothing. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Chinese authorities in Hong Kong removed one of the city's last remaining places of public commemoration of the bloody 1989 crackdown in Tiananmen Square. This whole past week, they've been taking down these memorials from one college campus, one municipal area after another, and now they've almost got all of them. And... A prominent Egyptian human rights activist was released from prison after serving her sentence on charges of broadcasting fake news about the spread of COVID-19 in Egyptian prisons. That is a pandemic in and of itself. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
here the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link. And the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. You know, she's quite busy, so thank you for everything that you do here. If you would then look across the page from the chat room link, uh, you'll notice to the left near the bottom of our homepage at netroosradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And I'm going to give you a little gift today, and I'm not going to give you a long spiel. After these holidays are over, if you're able to afford an espresso-type coffee drink and send those funds to us once a month, it will really help. So Merry Christmas! And when you're able to help, please do, because we need the help. Oh, indeed. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio. Oh, you know what? I should mention also thank you to everybody who has been sustaining us through this past year and previous years as well. Some of you are uh, long term. You're long haulers. And uh, we really appreciate your generosity Because truly, we would be unable to do it without you. So thank you to those who have been helping out uh, for so long. And uh, when those of you who are able to in the future, yes, indeed, we can use the help. All right. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, you can do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. And he's a busy fellow, too. So thank you, Tom, for everything that you help out with us here. And you can also follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary about 10 minutes before showtime. Get that linked up on Twitter and other social media platforms. I try. I try to do it 10 minutes before. Sometimes it's after. Anyway, you can also follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. And pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., Etc. Etc. All right. This uh, first offering in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is by John Hanna out of the Associated Press. Democratic Governor Laura Kelly spent 18 months sparring with Kansas's legislative Republicans over COVID-19 measures. In the early days of the pandemic, she imposed and then extended a stay-at-home order, issued a brief statewide mask mandate, and tried to limit in-person worship services, all while meeting growls of GOP protest. Then in November, two days after Republican Glenn Youngkin defeated Democrat Terry McAuliffe to become governor of reliably blue Virginia, Kelly expressed her first opposition to Democratic President Joe Biden's vaccine mandates. A couple of weeks later, she signed a bill aimed at helping Kansas workers resist vaccine mandates, a proposal that even the GOP-friendly Chamber of Commerce opposed. As Democrats shook their heads, Kelly's move signaled her efforts to appeal to moderate Republican and GOP-leaning independent voters who she will need to win a tough re-election race in a heavily Republican state next year. In other words, she has to appease and appeal to a death cult. Like Democratic governors in Michigan and Wisconsin, Kelly will try to win a second term against midterm political headwinds blowing in Republicans' favor. You know, everybody says that. But I actually think there's a lot of us. In fact, there was over 80 million of us who were kind of pissed off at this Nazi takeover of the United States of America. And then the Nazis uh, committed an insurrection because they didn't like the way the vote turned out. Who says that it's in their favor? Well, that's conventional wisdom, isn't it? Well, these aren't conventional times. Okay. But she's trying it in a state former President Donald Trump carried twice and where Republicans energized in opposition to Biden's vaccine mandates looked likely to avoid a serious primary fight. Her attempt 
to stake out ground in the political center has irritated some fellow Democrats in the short term, but others argue that tactic could work for her if she also hammers home a message that Kansas now has a stable budget and its public schools are considered fully funded. What Democrats need to remember is that she's doing that to try to win re-election. No shit, Sherlock. Oh, I guess it's not Sherlock. This is Mike Swenson, who has worked as a Democratic strategist and consultant in the Kansas City area for over four decades. He added, we can appeal to the moderates. Absolutely. (laughs) I don't know. See, I always had this problem when I was a chef when some people would argue, you can't cook what you want. You have to cook what they want. Well, isn't a chef's primary job is to is to raise the awareness, understanding and the palate of those who have come to test your wares? If you're a politician, aren't you supposed to lead rather than follow? I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm an idealist. And idealists obviously always finish last. Kelly said throughout the pandemic that she would follow science in addressing it, but Republican lawmakers use their legislative supermajorities to force her to accept more local control over decisions about requiring masks and restricting businesses, a move that al- allowed many communities to reject recommendations from public health officials. She weathered their criticism for making prison inmates an early priority for vaccines. And so she surprised some Democrats and liberal activists by publicly questioning Biden's vaccine mandates and quickly signing the Republicans' bill. The new law provides unemployment benefits if workers lose jobs for refusing shots and allows them to claim religious exemptions, no questions asked. The flying spaghetti monster said, I don't need this vaccine. Oh, okay. I don't think that's how it will work, though. Also, to some Democrats, she seemed closer to Republican leaders. Multiple Democratic lawmakers said they learned of her plans to sign the bill from GOP colleagues' gloating texts. It's a huge, huge gamble, said Christopher Reeves, who we know as Chris Reeves, on Daily Coast. Uh, Of course, we also know him as a Kansas City area consultant and former Democratic National Committee member. She signed the measure less than a week after the state health department's head abruptly resigned. Dr. Lee Norman was visible early in the coronavirus pandemic, appearing with Kelly at news conferences, often wearing a white lab coat. Internal emails showed an internal conflict this past summer over pandemic messaging. And Norman also recently said Kelly's administration ousted him because of COVID-19 politics. Kelly, positioning herself in the political center on vaccine, contrasts with her strong support for abortion access and LGBTQ rights. Kelly said during a recent AP interview that her decision-making isn't driven by what voters is going to keep in my camp, she was quoted as saying, And she cited major bipartisan legislation on school funding and transportation funding as examples of her approach. It's the only way to govern and govern well, she said. Well, we'll see. Thomas Beaumont of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits Christmas Eve Friday. 
Davenport's 81-year-old Centennial Bridge across the Mississippi River creaks under the weight of tens of thousands of cars and trucks every day. Rust shows through its chipped silver paint, exposing the steel that needs replacing. This city's aging landmark is among more than 1,000 structurally deficient bridges in the area. The tally gives Iowa's 2nd Congressional District the dubious distinction of having the second most troubled bridges in the country. So, it struck some Iowans as strange when the district's representative, Marionette Miller Meeks, voted against a bill that would pour more than $100 million in federal money to repair and replace bridges in southwest Iowa. Miller Meeks objected to majority Democrats' handling of the bill, never mentioning its contents, a common refrain from the minority that overwhelmingly opposed it. If anyone in Iowa's Iowa was surprised that the Republicans would oppose money for a glaring local priority. Few in Washington were. Strategists and one-time party leaders note it has become so common for lawmakers to prioritize their party's line over district needs that it's hardly ever mentioned anymore. The old politics or local axiom has been significantly eclipsed by one that says all politics are national, said Tom Kahn, a 33-year Capitol Hill staff veteran who teaches congressional strategy at American University. Democrats are banking on voter backlash to this trend as they press to push through a $2 trillion spending package following the $1 trillion infrastructure bill. They're hoping... Voters punish lawmakers like Miller Miller Meeks for opposing major new investments in health care, climate change mitigation, and child care. But even vulnerable lawmakers like Miller Meeks, who was elected in 2020 with a winning margin of just six votes, did not appear worried about paying a price. In New Mexico, Representative Yvette Harrell, a GOP freshman, voted against the infrastructure bill and its $100 million per state for improving broadband internet access. A quarter of the homes in Harrell's rural district lacked internet as of 2019. In California's Central Valley, Representative David Valadao could have told families of 190, no, I'm sorry, could have told families of 194,000 children he supported expanding a middle to lower income child tax credit in the Biden administration's two trillion sweeping spending bill. Valadal's agricultural heavy district has more children whose parents fit the re- requirements for the monthly 300 per child that than that of any Republican targeted by Democrats. Valadao voted against the bill, which passed the House and is now stalled in the Senate after Manchin stunned fellow Democrats by announcing last weekend that he would not support the bill as is. Miller Meek's office did not respond to several requests to discuss her vote. In a written statement issued publicly after the vote, she said she would have supported an infrastructure bill that was not tied to the larger spending package as Democrats for months work to move them in tandem. Miller Meeks and others are offering the procedural explanation when really they are following the national trend of party loyalty, demonstrating the shift from the time-honored politics of bringing home the bacon, GOP observers said. That's a company line, as I would call it. I've seen that by others, said former New York Rep. Tom Reynolds, a former chairman of National Republican Con- uh, Congressional Committee. Things have changed. It used to be, I brought back a number of things for my district. Now it's, I held firm against the opposition. Defectors are blasted as traitors and socialists by some House GOP colleagues, such as right-wing GOP Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene. Michigan Republican Representative Fred Upton received a voicemail wishing death to him, his family, and staff. 
there's probably still room for people who are making their cases on local issues, said John Ashbrook, a former aide to Senator Mitch McConnell, the Senate Republican leader. Well, we call him the Grim Reaper, but, you know, this is a family paper, apparently, with the AP. But there is so much national pressure shaping your image, he said, if you're a House member. Your fate is in the hands of the national movement. up the time on this Christmassy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays, this final offering here at the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Associated Press by Colleen Young. President Joe Biden yesterday, Thursday, made two final nominations to the federal bench this year as he caps his first year in office with 40 judges confirmed, the most since Ronald Reagan was president. Nancy Gabbana Abadou, his nominee for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit in the Deep South, would be the first black woman to sit on that court. The circuit covers Alabama, Georgia, and Florida, where 8.5 million people are black, yet there is only one black judge on the 12-person panel. Charles Wilson, and he was nominated by by former President Bill Clinton. Wow. The second nominee, also a woman of color, is J. Michelle Childs, currently a U.S. District Court judge for South Carolina. She is nominated to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the U.S. District of Columbia Circuit. Well, that is good news. Well, let's get to our break, no matter how short it's going to be today. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, Rawhide. To gain Oscar eligibility, Netflix has done a limited theater release for Jane Campion's first feature in 12 years, The Power of the Dog. Named for a verse in a psalm Jesus supposedly mentioned on the cross, this one, like her The Piano in the Underseen series Top of the Lake, is a slow build concentrating on character development. And what a character we get to watch here. Bill, a macho yet Yale-educated ranch hand, more by choice since he's also the ranch's part owner, is brought off with scary intensity by Benedict Cumberbatch. Batch. Phil has a staid brother, George, a sister-in-law, the sensitive Rose, Kirsten Dunst, and then there's Rose's creepy son, Peter. But most of all, Phil has a secret. It's mid-1920s Montana, and as Phil's behavior maybe suggests, he's aware of and motivated by a disconnect. He breaks horses and castrates bulls in a snap. He torments his brother, even more so Rose, but especially Peter. But we see Phil in the woods, swimming naked alone, and we get to see his stash of bodybuilding magazines and we get to know a sort of unseen character Bronco Henry a long dead ranching mentor for whom he maintains a shrine and whose handkerchief disturbingly he still carries by the third act we're not surprised by Phil's sudden change of heart towards Peter something which definitely can't be said about the bizarre conclusion 
Campion and cinematographer Ari Wegner contrast the claustrophobic with the big sky and shoot through objects and portals for effect as the characters find their disquieting places. Thomas Savage's novel, The Power of the Dog, may have been more revolutionary when released in 1967, but as a portrait of a tortured soul and the human vortex around him, the movie more than stands up. This has been Take-Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at Take-TwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. Land was plentiful in the 13 American colonies, but labor was scarce. There simply were not enough people to farm and perform all the tasks needed to keep a colony running. It was also expensive to sail from Britain to America. This reality created incentives for indentured servitude. Indentured servants agreed to an indenture which is a contract obligating them to work for a certain amount of time in exchange for passage to the colonies aboard a ship and room and board once they arrived. The length of time was often four years or more. Once they served out their contracts, indentured servants were sometimes awarded what were called freedom dues, which might include land, animals, clothing, and other goods helpful in starting life as a free person in America. Life for indentured servants was hard, however, and many died of disease in the harsh climate of the colonies. Despite this, the scholar Abbott Emerson Smith estimated that up to two-thirds of immigrants to the American colonies came there as indentured servants. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1913. That tragic Christmas Eve came to be known as the Italian Hall Disaster in Calumet, Michigan. A Christmas party was being held for children of striking copper miners. The strike had begun that July. Miners wanted the eight-hour day and better wages and conditions. They also wanted recognition of the Western Federation of Miners as their union. The mine owners stood staunchly against this demand. They formed a citizens' alliance to antagonize and harass labor. The strike was long and bitter. The union's women's auxiliary decided to hold a benefit party for the strikers' children. They put on their party in the upstairs of the Italian Hall. Between 300 and 400 children attended. As the program was going on, someone opened the door at the bottom of the stairs and shouted, Fire! Many children and adults attending the party panicked. They rushed downstairs to escape the building, but the door opened in, and the crush of bodies made it impossible to get out. More and more children came down the stairs, crushing those below. More than 70 people died. 60 were children. There was no fire. No one could ever prove who started the panic, but many believe it was strike breakers hired by the mine managers. Witnesses claimed that the person who instigated the disaster was wearing a Citizens Alliance button on his coat. The next day on Christmas, a Finnish workers' newspaper reported the grim story. The scene was a horrible one and will never be effaced from the minds of those who witnessed the terrible tragedy. Woody Guthrie memorialized the deaths in his song, The 1913 Massacre. Take a trip with me in 1913 To Calumet, Michigan in the copper country I'll take you to a place called Italian Hall. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com.
Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Christmas Eve Friday. We are under a winter storm watch and are expecting quite a bit of snow uh, with a little bit of rain and snow mixed in uh, through the weekend. But it looks like uh, the forecast is quite a bit of snow from now until Tuesday or Wednesday, so we will forego the rest of the local broadcast or weather forecast so that we can attend to the international realm. And weather from around the world is always brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations from a crowd that crowdsources from around the world. London is 50 degrees with a rain shower. Uh, Paris is 50 and cloudy. Rome is 56 and mostly cloudy. Kiev is 23 with a light snow shower. Kabul is 35 degrees and fair. Hong Kong is 62 and fair. Tokyo is 45 degrees with a rain shower. Sydney, Australia is 72 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 47, partly cloudy with a uh, weather advisory for heavy rain. And New York, New York is 35 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Zen Su of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A monument at a Hong Kong university that was the best-known public remembrance of the Tiananmen Square massacre on Chinese soil was removed early yesterday, Thursday, wiping out one of the city's last remaining places of public commemoration of the bloody 1989 crackdown. For some at the University of Hong Kong, the move reflected the erosion of the relative freedoms they have enjoyed compared to mainland China. The 26-foot-tall pillar of shame, which depicts 50 torn and twisted bodies piled on top of each other, was made by Danish sculptor Jens Galshoet to symbolize the lives lost during the military crackdown on pro-democracy protesters in Beijing's Tiananmen Square on June 4th of 1989. The university said it asked that the sculpture, which had been standing on its campus for more than two decades, be put in storage because it could pose legal risks. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Associated Press staff bring us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A prominent Egyptian human rights activist was released yesterday, Thursday, after serving her sentence on charges of spreading false news, insulting a, and insulting a police officer, her lawyer and family said. Sané Saif, who hails from a renowned family of activists, had been behind bars since June of 2020. She was convicted in March of 2021 of broadcasting what authorities said were fake news and rumors about health conditions and the spread of the coronavirus in Egyptian prisons. Mona Saif, her sister and also a prominent human rights advocate, posted photographs of Sana on social media showing her smiling and walking with friends upon her release. 
The development comes after an Egyptian court on Monday sentenced the safe sister's brother, Allah Abdel Fattah, to five years on charges of spreading false news, which was actually facts about the pandemic. He was first sentenced in 2014 on charges of taking part in an unauthorized protest. He was released in 2019 after serving a five-year term, but was rearrested again later that year in a crackdown that followed anti-government protests. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day and for the week. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up on Monday for River City Hash Mondays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day, all night, and all weekend. It's a holiday, but we still broadcast on. And we will meet up here on Monday, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver